Hi there! Today we're talking about one of the worst things ever, which is ugly wallpaper. But seriously, what we're really going to be talking about, what we're going to be diving into, is the horror of isolation. On that cheerful note, I would like to welcome you aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. I'm your host, Jules, and today I want to talk to you about one of the scariest stories I've probably ever read. And on first glance, it maybe doesn't seem that scary. But one time, I was listening to a podcast, and they were talking about this story, and as they came closer and closer to the end of it, I felt this almost like primordial dread rise up through my skin, and I, f- I felt this urge to hide my head under the covers like a child. So it's quite something. The story I'm talking about is The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. It was first published in 1892 in the New England magazine, and it really is just one of those standout works of American literature and especially American feminist literature. What we're going to do first is dive into the story itself. I'm going to explain to you how the story kind of builds up and give you a taste of some of the writing itself. And then we're going to dive into just why this story is actually horrifying. Here are the opening lines of The Yellow Wallpaper. It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral halls for the summer. A colonial mansion, a hereditary estate, I would say a haunted house, and reach the height of romantic felicity, but that would be asking too much of fate. Still, I will proudly declare that there is something queer about it. Else, why should it be let so cheaply? And why have stood so long untenanted? John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. That is our first introduction to our protagonist, a young woman who has managed, along with her husband John, to secure a beautiful mansion, a colonial mansion at that, for the summer. Her husband, John, is a doctor, or a physician, and he's also a very practical man who doesn't believe in superstition or any kind of other fanciful things. And he thinks his wife is big on fancy. (laughs) I don't think he has a lot of respect for her intellect, but I might be getting ahead of myself. Our protagonist is in the unfortunate situation that not just her husband is a physician, but so is her brother, and they both seem to think that something isn't entirely wrong with her. So they've put her on a mixture of phosphates or phosphites, she herself isn't entirely sure, as well as tonics, fresh air, and absolutely no work whatsoever. The reason she is on this is because she's suffering from something. They aren't entirely sure what is wrong with her, but they know something is, because she isn't entirely normal in their eyes. In fact, she's just had a child, so her and John have a little baby with them in the mansion, and they've decided that because her nerves are all over the place, a restful summer is exactly what she needs. Now, the yellow wallpaper is told to us in diary entries from our protagonist. And throughout these diary entries, she kind of describes their life in the mansion. And initially, there is a lot of attention for what this mansion looks like. So it's quite a big house, and it's roomy, and it's beautiful. But as she said at the beginning, there is something queer about it. There is something slightly odd. But it does have a beautiful garden, which is so luscious and green and overgrown. She loves looking at it. And in fact, looking at it is really kind of all that she can do because she's mostly confined to her rooms. Now, she doesn't like the room where John has kind of put her up. She wanted one of the rooms downstairs in the mansion, which were a little bit more open and nicely decorated. But instead, John said that she should stay in one of the rooms upstairs. This room has only one window, and there is only one bed. She's also not really allowed to do much. So as she tells us in her first diary entry, I have a scheduled prescription for each hour in the day. He takes all care for me, and so I feel basically ungrateful not to value it more. John has basically restricted what she can do during the day so that she gets as much rest as possible. 
And this room used to be a nursery and a gymnasium, she thinks, so a place where someone did sport, because the windows are barred, which would make sense if there were little kids in there, and there are rings and things kind of stuck in the wall, which might make sense if people maybe had sporting equipment there or something. But yeah, she doesn't really like the room. And in part that is because it has the worst possible wallpaper one could possibly imagine. She describes it as one of those sprawling flamboyant patterns committing every artistic sin. On top of that, it's yellow, which is gross. She says the colour is repellent, almost revolting, a smouldering, unclean yellow, strangely faded by the slow-turning sunlight. It's just boring enough that your eye somehow gets caught in it anyway. As she's telling us this, though, John comes in and she has to put her pen down. In the next entry, she tells us that it's already been two weeks and she's still sitting in this room. John is away and, you know, the nurse is looking after the baby. So there's really not a whole lot for her to do, except trying to get well, I guess. And John has promised that when she gets well, they will invite her cousin over and his wife and they will have a nice visit and they will do all the lovely things she can't currently do. So really, her main wish is to get better. But she's not being helped by the paper because it looks to her as if it knew what a vicious influence it had. There is especially one spot on the wallpaper where it kind of feels like there are eyes in it which are staring at her with like this angry emotion. It's not really normal, I guess, to put that much life into an inanimate thing like wallpaper, but she just can't help staring at it, and it's bringing up all these kind of weird thoughts. On top of that, the wallpaper is kind of torn off in some places, and there's also scratches and gouges in the floor, in the plaster and the walls, and the bed itself that she's sleeping on kind of is in a bit of a rough shape as well. It's honestly not an ideal room to rest in. I would not be peaceful there. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> but the thing that's actually making everything so much worse is that she feels like there is a figure skulking behind the design of the wallpaper. But then someone comes up and her diary entry breaks off. At this point, we're already past the 4th of July, which was a bit of a celebration, but, you know, our narrator wasn't really allowed to do anything. The nurse called Jenny was actually looking after everything. But, you know, her mother came to visit and her sister with her kids, so she did see some people. John, meanwhile, is off again somewhere. He is in town very often, doing things, all while she's just sitting there. But at this point, she says, I'm getting really fond of the room in spite of the wallpaper. Perhaps because of the wallpaper. She just lies there in this bed, which she now thinks might be nailed down to the floor, and just looks at the pattern and how it changes in the sunlight. And she can do this for hours, because while the pattern repeats itself, it may also kind of look like it's moving a little bit, especially as the sunlight moves over it across the day. And then it kind of hits a point where our narrator is no longer entirely sure what she's doing. She doesn't really want to write anything in her diary, especially because John doesn't actually want her to keep a diary. She doesn't really feel like she's able to write anything intelligent and she feels bad about breaking the rules and she's just lying in bed and by now she's kind of also lost the desire to really do anything else. She just really wishes her cousin and his wife could maybe come to visit so that she could get some diversion. But I guess she has this nervous weakness, she supposes, and it makes sense, therefore, that, you know, John has just carried her upstairs and put her in this bed and read to her until she got tired, and it sucks that now all that she is is tired, but she just needs to get better, and then everything will be fine. And meanwhile, the figure behind the pattern on the wallpaper is getting clearer and clearer by the day, and she thinks that what she can see there is a woman stooping down and creeping around. She doesn't really like it, and she just really wishes John could maybe let her out of the room now, please. John isn't really big on talking to her about the room or about maybe her doing something other than just resting there. She did wake him up at some point and asked him to come look at the wallpaper with her because she could just see that figure behind shaking at the pattern on the wallpaper as if it was trying to get out. And John literally calls her a little girl and asks her what is wrong. 
And she's like, can we maybe just leave? <laughs> I would like to leave. And he says, we still have a lease for three weeks and we definitely can't leave before. And she's like, well, could we just anyway? John, meanwhile, calling her darling and little girl and sweetheart throughout is just really focused on her health, you know? He's like, no, you're gaining weight. You're starting to look better. And she's like, I'm not gaining weight. I'm not feeling better. Can we please just leave for my sake, but also for the sake of our child? And he says no. And he gets to decide. And again, for the next few kind of diary entries, we just get this woman's perception of the pattern of the wallpaper and how it's moving around. And well, how the pattern itself isn't really moving around, but how the figure behind it is moving about. And she seems to be trying to get out of the pattern, trying to break out from the restriction that it imposes upon her. I think you can probably already tell that restriction and isolation is a big theme in this story. Our narrator thinks that she has caught John also looking at the wallpaper, as well as the nurse, Jenny, and she's pretty sure that they must see something wrong with it as well, especially Jenny. But nothing really happens. They seem to just deny that anything weird is going on, and so she says, I am determined that nobody shall find it out but myself. And by that she means finding out what is wrong with the pattern. So now she has a mission and life is a little bit more exciting and she is feeling a bit better because she has to figure out what's happening with the wallpaper. And John is so pleased that she seems to be doing better. He's like, this is great. And he's like, yeah, maybe we can leave now soon because you're feeling better. And now our narrator is like, no, I don't want to leave. We've only got a week left and I still need to figure out what is going on with this wallpaper. But she thinks a week might be just enough time to figure out what is going on. And so she doesn't really sleep. She's just looking at the wallpaper. And the wallpaper is quite boring actually during the daytime. But when it comes to night, that's when the wallpaper becomes a little bit more interesting. Because she's realized that the pattern at the front of the wallpaper does move because the woman behind it is shaking it. And then in the bright spots, where it's just a bit more light, the woman seems to stand still. Whereas in the shady spots behind the pattern, she's shaking them really hard and she's trying to climb through. Nobody can really climb through it because this pattern is so ugly, but also it seems to be made up of all these fungoid things, all these weird plant forms. And then, in our next diary entry, our narrator has a breakthrough because she's realized that the woman can get out of the pattern during the daytime. And she knows this for certain because she has seen her. It is the woman from the wallpaper that she now can see creeping. And as she says, it is the same woman, I know, for she is always creeping, and most women do not creep by daylight. And the fact is, she doesn't see her in the room or on the wallpaper. She sees her outside, in the garden, creeping around there. And sometimes she seems to be hiding and then she comes out, but she's always surrounded by this garden. John, meanwhile, is acting a bit weird. She kind of wishes that he would, you know, stay in another room and not kind of visit her quite so often because she doesn't want anyone to get the woman out except herself. So, yeah, maybe John could just leave. Meanwhile, what she's now trying to do is get the pattern of the wallpaper so that this woman could potentially get out. And while she's trying to do that, she's found out some other funny things too. She can hear John ask Jenny loads of questions about her, whether she's doing well, etc. And Jenny's like, yes, she's sleeping very well during the day. But John is also very aware that our protagonist or our narrator isn't sleeping at night. So he keeps questioning her. And at this point, with kind of our tension rising, with our narrator trying to get at this pattern so that the woman behind it and the wallpaper can get out, and with John asking all kinds of questions and wondering what could possibly be going on, we hit the last day of their stay in this mansion. John was in town overnight and he's not coming back until the evening, kind of trying to sort, I guess, final things out. And Jenny was like, maybe I can sleep in the room with you. And our narrator was like, no, that's fine. <laughs> I can totally sleep better on my own. So Jenny allows her to stay there on her own. And as soon as it turns to evening and that woman behind the wallpaper was crawling, 
our narrator runs up to the wallpaper to try and help and she's pulling at the wallpaper and the woman behind it is shaking at it and together they peel off just yards of that paper during the night. So this has all happened in the night leading into the final day, right? So now there is one more day and one evening and then the next morning is when they're actually going to be leaving. And Jenny is like, okay, maybe it's time to get out of the room because you've pulled all the wallpaper down. <laughs> That's a weird thing to be doing. And Anorita is like, no, I will stay. Just call me when we leave, okay? And our narrator is enjoying the room now that it's a bit bare and a bit calmer. And, you know, the children who used to stay here really just did a full-on job on this room. I mean, things in this room have been gnawed upon. At this point, our narrator has locked the door to the room and she's thrown the key down the window and into the front path so no one can get in. And she also doesn't want to get out anymore. She just wants to stay in this room until John comes back and then she's just going to astonish him. Alongside the key, which she'd used to then lock the room, she also got a rope, which Jenny doesn't know anything about. And she's going to use that to tie the woman down, the woman from behind the wallpaper, in case she gets out. She's also trying to push the bed around so that maybe she can get better purchase for when she's trying to get this woman out. But well, the bed won't move. It has been nailed down. And she says that she got so angry, I bit off a little piece at one corner, but it hurt my teeth. And then she continued to peel all the paper off as far as she could reach from the floor, since she couldn't climb onto the bed, because the bed will not move. And so she's just ripping things away, and the wallpaper is very unhappy about it. And she's getting quite annoyed by it, but, well... She says jumping out of the window would have actually been the suitable thing to do at this point with how frustrated she is, but let's not forget there are bars on the window, so she couldn't even really do that. And also, the window has become a bit of a sore spot for her, because now that she looks out of it, she can see all the creeping women in the garden, and they just creep so fast, and she doesn't know if they all came from the wallpaper or if they came from other places, but she is determined that she will not leave this room. She will not go out there creeping around like these women. So now she has fastened herself with the rope. They will not get her out of this room. And also, the benefit of not leaving the room is that, as she says, here I can creep smoothly on the floor and my shoulder just fits in that long smooch around the wall so I cannot lose my way. And then John has come back. It is our last evening after all. And he's trying to get in and he's um, calling her name and he is pounding on the door. Now he's asking for an axe. And she's like, why would you break down my beautiful door? And she's like, John, you don't have to break down the door. You don't need to get an axe. The key is downstairs. Well, outside, because that's where I threw it, right? And then he's silent and he's like, please open the door, darling. And she's like, I can't, like I told you, the key is outside. I chucked it out. And she keeps telling him that and she's very gentle about it and she says it very slowly. He goes to look for it and then he comes back with it and he opens the door and he's like, oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> she's just creeping. But she looks at him and she says, I've got out at last, in spite of you and Jane, and I've pulled off most of the paper so you can't put me back. And weirdly enough, the man faints. And he does so right across her path. So she has to creep over him every time. And that is how the yellow wallpaper ends, with our unnamed narrator crawling and creeping along the wall. Now, in the next section, we're going to briefly talk about Charlotte Perkins Gilman herself, and then look at some of the themes of the story. Charlotte Perkins Gilman was born on July 3rd, 1860, and she wrote this after some personal experiences, which I want to touch on briefly. She married a man called Charles Walter Stetson in 1884, but she was quite hesitant about accepting his proposal, so she first declined it because apparently she had kind of like this gut feeling that it wasn't the best thing for her. Eventually, she did marry him though, and they had a daughter a year later, at which point Gilman suffered a quite serious kind of case of postpartum depression. Unfortunately, 
The 1800s were not the best time for a woman to have mental health issues because they were still full-on hysterical and nervous beings, according to the medical industry. So Gilman partially found her complaints dismissed, but she then did see a doctor, and his name was Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell, and he was apparently a leading expert on women's mental health at the time, and he was a big proponent of the rescue, which basically involved bed rest and no work and also no kind of intellectual engagement. So it was very much prohibited to read, write, paint or engage in any other kind of activities that might stimulate the brain. Because the idea was that women were already overworked, they were already stressed, so they should not be engaging with their imagination whatsoever. So Charlotte had to deal with this rescue for three months and at this point she was desperate and she realized that it was going downhill fast and that she needed a second opinion at the very least and she started to work again. She also saw a new doctor called Mary Putman Jacoby who was one of the first female doctors and there is an excellent article on her by Marina Corrin in The Atlantic called The Pioneering Female Doctor Who Argued Against Rest, which I'll link to in the description. But basically, Charlotte got a second opinion and sat down to write again, and she herself realized how close she had come to a breakdown during the rescue. And this is what really inspired the yellow wallpaper, so her own personal experiences, which is why I think the story is just so affecting as well, because Charlotte knows exactly what this woman is feeling and what she was going through. Now, initial responses were not ideal. There was apparently an editor who refused to accept the story or to publish it because it made him feel miserable and he didn't want to make other people feel miserable, which I think is quite a step to take. I appreciate maybe not everyone enjoys stories like this, but stories like this are nonetheless necessary. And this brings me to an interesting interpretation which I've read. So, of course, there are a lot of different interpretations of this story, especially among feminist literary critics, but also just literary critics in general. It's an incredibly fruitful text, if that makes sense. You can draw a lot from it. But one thing I read which I thought was really interesting was proposed by Sari Edelstein, or Edelstein, who argued that the yellow wallpaper functions as a bit of an allegory for Gilman's dislike of what was called yellow journalism. So yellow journalism is this American term, I think, especially for kind of journalism and newspapers that don't present well-researched news, which are just focused on sensational headlines, scandal, sensationalism, all of that kind of stuff. And that was called yellow journalism. And of course, the wallpaper is the yellow wallpaper. So it's kind of this idea that the wallpaper itself can be considered as maybe discourse or as conversation. So that what Charlotte is arguing against and what she's kind of suffering from when she's struggling with this wallpaper is the way in which people talk, the way in which discourse is formulated and how it excludes women's experiences, how it's based on prejudice and sensationalism rather than actual research and that she herself, as a woman, but her narrator as well, and other women are caught in this discourse, that it's almost impossible for them to escape from it. And I think that's fascinating because there's a lot of feminist academics who work in psychoanalysis territory who talk about language as a signifier and how language is maybe a patriarchal object and that women cannot properly express themselves in this language. So I find that really interesting to consider that this oppression of the yellow wallpaper is not just a really ugly wallpaper and that it's not just about isolation, but that it also represents this barrier between women and public discourse. And that's really interesting to me. So I'm going to have to read more about what Sarah Edelstein wrote there. Of course, the kind of main thrust of the story, I would say, is this idea that women's concerns about their health were being dismissed um, that the language that was being used about them whenever they potentially had concerns was dismissive but also cruel and that this led to women being isolated and kind of punished through the rest cure that they were given and that it actually had a negative effect on women. And as such, for some critics, the end of the story is a success. <laughs> um, the idea that the narrator 
kind of finds freedom through her madness, that it allows her to escape the confines that have been placed upon her by a patriarchal society, that that is actually happiness for her. And that the way in which she kind of crawls over her husband's kind of body on the floor after he he's fainted and that she's completely detached herself from that reality, that that is actually a good thing for her. And that is, of course, utterly tragic that that counts as a happy ending. And it is especially that final scene which really gets me every single time. When you start realizing that not only has she been imagining this woman behind the wallpaper, but that what she's been seeing slowly but surely is the way in which she herself is stuck and trapped. And that she has to kind of externalize that through the woman in the wallpaper and then she begins to identify with the person behind the wallpaper. And once she's liberated that woman, she herself is free. And it's it's done beautifully with how there's so much time spent throughout the story with her wondering and observing this wallpaper. And then that last diary entry is just so quick. And there's so much happening all at once. And it kind of builds up this, this almost horror-like tension until John opens this door and sees his wife crawling along the floor, completely detached. And it's it's more than he can bear, definitely. But also for me, reading it and listening to it, it becomes horrifying. And yet I can recognize the freedom of it. And I think it's that fine line that marks kind of horror stories, which I would almost classify this as, but also just thriller stories, suspense stories, psychological suspense in this case. This is why it makes them so effective. Because you can imagine that building pressure and that something has to snap. You can also imagine John's horror at seeing his wife that way. Probably he does not realize that he pushed her that far. But that is what he has done. And he kind of meets the consequences of his own actions in that way. And she is potentially beyond rescue, but she is also free. And that mixture of feelings and responses that you get, it just gives me goosebumps. And therefore, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you read this story, but potentially don't do it at midnight, <laughs> because it may give you bad dreams if you're open to it. On a final note, The Yellow Wallpaper, of course, also has gothic overtones, I would say. We discussed a gothic novella not too long ago, Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu, and you can definitely see some of the elements uh, that were at play there in The Yellow Wallpaper as well. So we have this old mansion, which she at the beginning describes as colonial and as hereditary. So there's already this sense potentially of, of ancient evil, because of course, colonial mansions are tied very much to slavery. So already this idea of oppression, of people crawling around in the fields and in the garden outside and where they're potentially coming from, the idea that this house has already seen evil, which then makes sense when you think of this room, which has these barred windows and rings in the wall where this woman is contained, so perhaps this has happened before. So you get kind of this hereditary, repetitive abuse of a human spirit. And that works really well. And even though the tone of the story is quite funny at times, so the narrator has a real knack to describing things. And especially at the beginning, she's still a little bit flippant, but then her observatory skill goes from noticing just funny weird things to ominous weird things. And that switch, you almost don't notice it at the moment that it happens, but then in the diary entries afterwards, you can tell something has changed. The ending has this almost joyful disconnect to it, which means that the story stays kind of funny and horrifying all at once, which is just masterful. This story has absolutely earned its place in the canon of, I think, not just American feminist literature, but feminist literature in general. I think it really contributed to the short story form, but also women's writing being recognized to kind of represent kind of the female experience of life in a very different way. And it kind of continues to get mined for new ideas and new expressions. And it continues to also just give back to its reader in a very interesting way. So, although I've already told you what happens, don't consider yourself too spoiled, because I could never tell you the creepy, horrifying way in which Charlotte Perkins Gilman writes The Yellow Wallpaper. And that's it.
for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.